The Internet of Everything is not only the conference theme this year, is actually broadly considered as a new frontier for semiconductor industry. Today, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Sophie Vanderbilt of Xerox Corporation to discuss the three pillars that enable the Internet of Everything. Dr. Sophie Vanderbilt is Xerox Chief Technology Officer and the president of Xerox Innovation Group. She leads Xerox Research Center in Europe Asia, Canada, and the US, including Park Inc., an R&D service business. Dr. Vanderbroek is a fellow of IEEE, a Fulbright fellow, and a fellow of a Belgian American Educational Foundation. She was recently inducted into the Women in Technology International Hall of Fame, elected into Roy Flemish Academy of Arts and Science. She holds 14 US patents. She is a member of the board of a director of Analogic Corporation and Index Laboratory. She served on the advisory council of the Dean of Engineering, MIT. Dr. Vanderbroek earned her master's degree in electromechanical engineering from KU Leuven, Belgium, and a PhD in electrical engineering from Cornell University. Please join me to welcome Dr. Vanderbroek. Great, thank you, Kevin. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you. Good. That was a, a great talk, uh, Bill. Um, let's see where is the, okay, here. Fantastic. Although I did not have a paper at the ISSEC in 1986, I did have a paper at the IEDM, the International Electron Device Meeting, at 1987, so one year later, and I was first author on that paper. Um, <laughs> with that, let me start with a quote. The most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. So this quote to me really visualizes what the internet of everything is all about. The whole environment around us will be smart. Intelligence will be embedded everywhere. And no matter where you are, which room, your home, your work, your car, your, the hospital, wherever you are, the, the, the environment, your ambient will know who you are and what you need and what you want. It's so very visionary, the vision for the Internet of Everything. But in fact, this quote was coined by one of my colleagues in the late 80s. Uh, Mark Weiser, at that time, he called this it ubiquitous computer. He, is, he was working as a researcher at the Park Research Lab, and we were experimenting with devices uh, such as the one that you see here on the screen, uh, pads that people could carry around with, and uh, connect themselves to what we now call the Internet of Everything. So today, in my presentation, I will touch on three of the pillars of the Internet of Everything. The first one, obviously, you need smart devices or smart objects. As I mentioned, they can be in your home, your business, your city. Next, I will touch on the networks, the technologies embedded within the networks that will connect all these smart objects to people, to themselves, etc. And finally, bring it all together, I will touch on the technologies, especially bring it down to silicon and circuits, to those that our community here can really help enable uh, as it relates to creating insights, valuable insights from the sensor data and then actuating processes to make a really positive impact to the world, to business and, and to people's lives. So my talk will be organized among these three pillars, as you can see here, uh, smart everyday object, information-centric networking, and automated real-time insights. Before uh, going into the detail, let me give you some context. The Internet of Everything uh, is really uh, a very, very uh, big buzzword today, right? It's, it's on the cover of Harvard Business Journal and uh, written about in many other uh, articles. 
by 2020, there will be 50 billion objects connected to the internet, significantly more than the number of people on our, on our planet. The biggest uh, benefit, economic benefit today, it's expected to be 1.7 trillion by 2020, uh, and this is, yeah, US dollars. Uh, the biggest economic benefit today comes from uh, efficiency improvements in commercial uh, processes. For example, the right is an example from General, General Electric, where the engine is smart and self-aware, so it knows and gives messages uh, for when maintenance is required, for example. On the left, you can see across the different industries, this will create a lot of economic value and is creating already a lot of economic value. In fact, GE called it the Internet of Industrial Things. At Xerox, uh, we have also, for over 15 years now, remotely serviced uh, our devices, our devices from our customers that are connected to the internet. They are telling us how many pages were printed, what is the, the cost, when is maintenance required. So this has been going on for a long time, well before the Internet of Everything term was coined. The same in our transportation business, where we are the biggest uh, government transportation service provider in the world, where we, where we process, for example, two billion uh, uh, toll booth transactions, cars driving through toll booths and then doing all the financial processing at the back end, or uh, 37 billion public transit transactions, people pay ticketing to go on buses, on trains, and so all of these objects, these buses, these cars, these people, are connected, providing their data and information through devices such as transponders, smart cameras, smart cards, mobile devices, and more. In our healthcare business, we process uh, healthcare claims, in fact, over a billion of them uh, every year. We provide real-time insights to over 2,000 hospitals. And a lot of the analytics, to process so many claims, you cannot have human look at the documents. So it's all through machine learning and intelligence systems, uh, which is part of the third pillar I will discuss today. So let me go a little bit uh, more deeper uh, in each of these three pillars. So the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Today, you can see there are many, many devices, as I said before, connected, billions of them. However, there are trillions of more uh, devices or objects that can be connected to the internet. Everything, as I mentioned, around us and many, many consumables. These consumables today are dumb. I mean, they are dumb objects. They don't know anything about themselves. For example, here is a wine bottle, right? Uh, one of our favorite wines, it's Spanish wine. Uh, and the label gives information to me, uh, or to the user, the consumer of the wine, but it doesn't know anything about uh, itself. It doesn't, uh, and so what recently, in collaboration with Tinfilm, uh, Xerox just now, in January, has launched these smart labels with a little amount of memory embedded, such that the bottle, as it goes through from production, through being on your table, you can track touch points in the value chain uh, of this bottle by saying, for example, here it was produced, this country it entered, and ultimately it ends up on your table. So you can reprogram this memory. But still, it's pretty dumb. So over time, these labels will become more and more smart. So here you can see the, the next generation that will be launched, which has all printed electronics, so not only memory, but also the sensor itself, logic, and a display. And so now, not only do we know where the wine bottle went, we also know if it exceeded either to high temperature or to low temperatures, such that you might no longer want to drink it, for example. And so in our labs, uh, and especially in, in Park Inc. here in Silicon Valley, uh, as well as a Canadian lab, we have been working for 15 years on printed electronics, and here are some of the circuits uh, that have been totally printed, 100% printed. You can see there are image sensors, pulse generators, flexible batteries, amplifiers, so there's a wide array of circuits, and I'm sure many of you in the room are working on these too. And so out of those circuits, you can build a whole array of objects or devices that are smart. Uh, across a variety of verticals. Uh, again, whether it's tracking packages, in healthcare, uh, in, in uh, uh, automotive, uh, et cetera. 
And so, but sometimes printed electronics alone is not good enough, uh, especially if you want to have uh, devices that harvest their own energy, or that, for example, have some analytics embedded within them that, that could become intelligence. You need silicon. Here is an example uh, of a strain sensor, a wireless strain sensor that 100% harvests its energy uh, from the ambient, uh, as you can see, from the RF waves. And so you have to add silicon. Once you add silicon, it becomes a hybrid electronic object or, or device. And so there is a whole ecosystem being created, or in fact, that has been created recently it, it, in the United States, this consortium between industry, and especially the printing industry and the electronics industry, uh, was created to focus on three areas. Number one is the flexible substrates, very low cost, print as much as you can, low cost, flexible. The other one is very thin, flexible, high performance silicon chips to, to put some brains into these devices and then bring it all together in low cost integration and assembly. Today, the low cost integration and assembly is all uh, pick, and, pick and place uh, approaches. And you can see many members in this consortium. Here are some of the technologies or some of the uh, original prototypes that are in our labs. Um, you can see a pressure sensor uh, in a shoe or you have a bear die and now you need to make connections to it. That's not very tricky as, as most of you know. Or you can in fact embed electronics within all kinds of medical, medical devices. And so one of the breakthroughs that goes well beyond pick and place to pull the, the smarts and the flexible electronics together uh, is this new approach uh, that's called microchip uh, ink printing. So normally the center here is one of our high-end production, digital production presses. So that's a printer that prints documents today. On the left, you make inks instead of colors, different colors and toner particles or ink. Yeah, toner particles in this situation. Uh, you take the silicon chips, embed them, uh, charge them, and then put them through this system. You print them on a, uh, a belt, and then uh, they go to where they need to be. Uh, and then you transfer that image or that belt to the final flexible substrate, and you make the connections. It's very, very fascin fascinating technology, but it is a breakthrough. It is in the research labs. It is not going to be a commercial product soon, but it's very fascinating and lots of uh, significant work happening. So if you look at the roadmap, you go, of course, from the ICs to hybrid electronic devices and ultimately to integrated systems, smart objects where both the object itself is printed on demand, 3D printed, while embedding the electronics within it. So you can envision a whole array of interesting objects. Let me show you a two minute video uh, in one of our researchers at Park uh, talking about uh, some of these technologies that I shared with you. I'm Eugene Chow. I work in the Electronic Materials and Devices Lab at Park. Today, Park scientists are working to take Xerox's printing technology beyond making marks on paper. They are using printing as the mechanism for making things, making it an integral piece of the manufacturing ecosystem. This future represents a significant opportunity for Xerox. 3D printing is being used to manufacture an array of items, everything from toys to prototypes to medical devices such as hearing aids, dental crowns, and even prosthetic limbs. Xerox's inkjet print heads, developed for solid ink printers, are being used in these applications by major 3D print manufacturers. The next wave in the convergence of printing and manufacturing is printed electronics. Park's unique technology enables the printing of thin film transistors using novel materials to print conductive tracks and electrodes on flexible substrates. Working with partners such as ThinFilm and Samsung, our scientists are working to take these technology prototypes to full production scale. Printed electronics development recently achieved a milestone with the creation of smart tags. These tags are inexpensive, costing only 10 to 20 cents each to produce. Our partner, ThinFilm, has announced relationships with packaging and consumer packaged goods companies, and these advanced smart tags will be in the marketplace within two to three years. However, the potential for printing goes even further. We are working on even more disruptive applications for advancing our printing technologies in some early stage DARPA-funded research 
that will enable us to embed electronics in everything. Our nascent chips as ink technology is creating the ability to print circuitry within objects so that we can grow an integrated system. This disruptive application of printing can enable a whole new world of advanced systems, such as NASA's morphing aircraft that can mimic the performance of a bird's wing to adapt during flight to different situational needs. So overall, this future enabled by the integration of printed electronics and printed structures will dramatically change how we interact with our physical world, thus radically transforming how we live our own lives. Cool. So when you fly home after this conference and see the wings of your plane change shape, panic. Because this is only going to be there uh, quite a few years from now. Okay, uh, so as a challenge for our community, right? So there are several things that will need to happen to silicon circuits. Number one, you need to be able to have any form factor, robust, flexible. You need to be able to embed high performance and functionality on demand that could be unique uh, to, set to, to, to the particular situation. And number three, there needs to be low cost. I would say ultra low cost, ultra low power, extremely uh, important. So next, the second, the second pillar. So now that we have all these smart devices uh, uh, having a lot, a lot of data, uh, generating a huge amount of data, how do we, how does the network of the future, what does it look like? In fact, uh, the basic network protocols are over four decades old. Here's a sketch that Bob Metcalf uh, made in 1972 on a whiteboard board at the park, at our labs. Um, the original sketch of the Ethernet. But the Ethernet, the Internet today is significantly challenged. There is an explosion of connections. More and more people are connected, more and more mobile devices. And pretty soon, these trillions of everyday objects. There is a lot of content, the video streaming, sounds, and a huge volume of very diverse sensor data. And that comes with a lot of issues, issues about reliability, security, privacy. For example, you might have heard of the smart nest thermostat that had a reliability issue, and suddenly it was, it was freezing cold overnight in many people's homes because the software and the reliability of these smart thermostats had an issue. And so not only uh, reliability, but also security. You might have heard about the hacking of the baby monitors or your home cameras in your home that you can remotely access through your mobile devices. It's fairly easy to hack. In fact, my son uh, was showing us how to do it. And so if, one of the challenges with this old infrastructure is also that it basically is not designed for today's internet. The internet mirrors a phone connection. It's a point-to-point -point communication. In the phone you have, uh, like I'm dialing your phone number, it's a particular number, the same in the internet today. It's an IP address, and it's for point-to-point -point communication. And so that creates a lot of issues. For example, on the left, uh, if everybody that wants to get a certain content all goes to the same place, it's a lot of heavy traffic of the servers that create the producer of the content and very slow loading at the consumer of the content. And so there are several solutions being worked. In fact, here with content delivery networks, where you just duplicate the content closer to the edges of the internet. In addition, uh, the National Science Foundation in the United States has been funding several next generation internet architecture programs. Uh, the most, the breakthrough, uh, the really the most, uh, the one with the most traction today it's called information-centric networking. And two main research groups uh, are working on it, but the fundamentals are identical. Uh, one is content-centric networking, and the park team is taking the lead there. The other one is named data networking, and the lead, the PI, is at UCLA. Fundamental idea is that instead of having this IP address, you call uh, what you need by name. It's a content packet instead of an IP packet. And so, but everything else, the basic infrastructure, uh, the links of the internet, as well as the applications, for the most part, can remain the same, those that exist today. It opens up a variety of novel innovation opportunities, but it leverages the basic inf infrastructure of the internet. Let me tell you how this works. So, 
this new information-centric networking is designed for content delivery. For example, I'm the consumer, right? The consumer can be a human on an iPhone or a tablet, but it can also be an object. The consumer can be a car that needs to know if there, if there are some potential safety issues. And later this morning, one of the plenary speakers will talk about vehicle to everything uh, communication and networks. But anyway, the consumer has an interest, and it's called an interest packet. It goes to the producer of the content, which again can be your conventional producers like a Netflix, YouTube, the Apple Store, or it could be a traffic camera. For example, uh, there's an intelligent traffic camera, or it could be other cars around you. And so the, up the, when the content is replied, at the very source, it is named, it has a specific name, it is authenticated, and the content itself is encrypted. So it is secure. So hacking of a baby monitor would not be possible because the content is secure. That does not happen today. Today in the internet, the pipe between the two endpoints is secure, like through virtual private networks, et cetera. Or, and so I am going to give you an example uh, of what, the, what additional values it brings. And for example, I'm a user, and I want to watch a very hot music video, a newly released music video. Many, many users around the world are going to want to see this. It's, kind of, it's timely. So I send an interest packet, and it goes through the different routers on the internet, and it gets to the producer of the video. The producer then sends the content back and selectively distributes the content in the different routers over the internet, such that the next user, it could be myself switching to my mobile phone, or it could be another, my neighbor's house, and now she wants to download it, uh, only needs to go to the closest router that has this content embedded uh, to then be able to view it and consume it. And so it's, it really uh, lowers the traffic on the internet, and it really makes it much more secure. So it's simple, fast, efficient, secure, and authorized retrieval of content. And this technology is being targeted to embed the in, within the 5G mobile technology uh, roadmap uh, that you will hear also about in the next keynote speaker. And so what does it mean to us, right? Uh, we, if you store content in these routers, today the routers are just very fast switching boxes. And in fact, they are designed to have the least memory as possible. And so in the future, you want to have as much memory as possible so you can in fact store this content across the, uh, the internet. And secondly, uh, today, uh, a packet, an IP packet, uh, is processed with about 100 cycles, clock cycles. If in this situation, with information-centric networking, you've, you need to do more intelligence. You need to know, has it been asked before? Is it here? Is it, if it has been asked before, I don't need to do anything. If it's, if it's uh, not asked before, I need to send the request forward. So you need about 1,000 clock cycles, which means if you still want to switch at the same speed or increase the speed of switching, you need much faster uh, processors embedded within, uh, within these routers. Uh, and so especially the routers closer to the edges of the internet uh, will uh, significantly benefit from um, embedding uh, more silicon. So lots of work for us also for many years to come. OK, so let's move into the uh, third pillar. So now that we have our smart objects, our networks, bring it all together to really create valuable insights. Um, let me give you two examples. One is an example uh, out of, uh, we call it urban mobility. How can people more seamlessly flow through cities, commute to cities from where they are to where they need to be, and how do city officials, how can they make more valuable and less congested and more liv livable cities? On the left, you see an app that uh, we just launched with, uh, in the city of Los Angeles, where because of all this transactional data, and because we know where the buses, the trains are at which point in time, or whether or not a parking spot is occupied or not, because there are sensors built into those. A partnership was also created with other providers of mobility, like Lyft or car sharing, bike sharing. Putting all this data together, you can very quickly have a personalized trip, even uh, look whether you want it more green or lower cost, etc. But then for the city officials, the data that's captured now by individuals traveling through a city can all be summarized and at a high level, a city official can look at where are the hotspots in my city. 
where are the bottlenecks? Where uh, throughout, of course, it varies throughout the week and throughout the day, such that she can quickly uh, make changes to, for example, in Los Angeles, we have an approach to have flexible pricing for parking. And that alone, if you communicate it well enough to, of course, the consumer, will spread out the traffic in the city. Or you can put more buses uh, on, the, on the nearer term, put more buses, more trains. On the long term, of course, you can totally change the infrastructure of your city. Within healthcare, uh, aggregating all the data around patients and being able to provide personalized care as well as looking at population health and making hospitals more effective and efficient by capturing the data from wearable devices and other devices to then ultimately give physicians and nurses uh, better tools to make decisions around the right care for patients. For example, based on doing some of the analytics, we can predict if somebody is going to be admitted to the emergency room uh, or what the right time is to allow the person to, to go home uh, it, and in, in a safe way. Uh, so let me show you uh, one of the things, other research programs uh, that has now been going on for many years and several of you in the audience most probably look, are also learning how to make cameras smarter, is a technology to remotely monitor vital signs and diseases. I'm going to show you a one-minute clip, and the researchers will talk about this particular uh, technology, which is really uh, one object in the Internet of Everything, this smart, smart camera. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a system uh, that measures uh, human vitals and disease, uh, non-contact? Uh, vitals like uh, respiration rate, uh, temperature, pulse rate. It's like uh, thinking about a medical tricorder. Yeah. And it'll be a radical innovation in healthcare. With contact, like for example ECG, you have to put leads in with adhesive gel on the skin, and particularly on neonates, the, the skin can come off you know, while removing the contact. So there is no need to have you know something on your body. <laughs> because uh, once you wear it on your body, it is an obstruction. Um, so we want to provide a technology which is easy to use and exists when you want it and is accurate and works extremely well. It would be available everywhere, in their offices or at homes or in hospitals. So in this video, uh, you saw the research project, the experiments were done in a hospital uh, in collaboration with our lab in Bangalore. Uh, and within these videos, you still see leads on the baby because they're calibrating between the real measurements and the video measurements. But they're very, I mean, they're really ex exceptional. They do exceptionally well at monitoring the vital signs. And so once this technology is rolled out and deployed, you no longer need any of these leads, which is truly amazing. And of course, as LK Meshta said, you can also use that to remotely monitor people in their homes. So I live in Boston, my mom is in Belgium, and uh, if she would allow me to put such cameras in her home, I could remotely monitor her temperature, her heart rate, her respiration rate. I could even visually see, depending on which camera is used, whether she has breast cancer or diabetes. So this is truly Googling reality, uh, what these smart devices at the edges of the internet allow you to do. So, if you have these devices all around you, like this poor man here, uh, they, uh, I like this cartoon. For example, the fridge says, uh, Fatty Pants is kidding himself if he thinks he's eating less than 2,000 calories a day. Or the vacuum cleaner refuses to pick up a french fry that uh, he left on the floor. He says, Lazy Bones can do it himself, right? So you have all these devices around you. And a lot of these analytics that can create these kind of insights is done by third-party suppliers in the cloud today. So is this the end of privacy? Because today, data is secure when it's stored, like on our, it's encrypted on our disk. The pipes between the endpoints are encrypted or with content-centric networking. The whole content, no matter where it flows, will be encrypted. So at, at rest and in, Transport, transmission, it's secure. The issue is there is no privacy, or it, it's not encrypted today, or there is no privacy during analytics. I know no is a strong word, but I'm wearing my Fitbit, and I know 
my data is raw and visible at the Fitbit server. Uh, so they would know how many steps I've taken on this podium or where I go, how much I sleep, etc. So there is really no privacy uh, during analytics today. So ideally, you would want high privacy. You can see this three-dimensional space, significant insights, as well as uh, good efficiency, right? The minimum processing power to be our memory requirements to be able to create valuable insights for uh, the world. However, industry practice today is in this corner. It's fairly efficient. I mean, you do the analytics on, on raw data. It, you create actually very, very good insights. I mean, it's amazing the insights on a personalized basis that can be created today. But as I said, very little privacy. In fact, even, I mean, the, some of the things that's being done, like driven by HIPAA and all the regulations around the globe, uh, is anonymizing the data. Okay, let's just take out her name, her uh, social security number, a passport identification number, no matter, depending on the country you're in. Let's take out a, a set of the address of these things, anonymize. Uh, but even then, it's very easy to identify the person. For example, Professor Sweeney, she was able to look at uh, the medical data in, in an anonymized way and then map it to the voting records of people in Massachusetts and be able to identify and expose the medical record of the governor of Massachusetts. So it is not private. So what, are, what, are, uh, what is the state of the art research today? And that's a blue uh, spot there. Uh, you can get, in fact, very high privacy. The issues is you cannot yet get significant um, insights and it's not very efficient yet. Let me show you. One of the breakthroughs is homomorphic encryption. It's a way to create cipher text uh, and encrypt the original information, create cipher text on which you can do calculations and which can then really create some meaning, meaningful results. The problem is it's a million times slower and you need significantly more memory uh, for those of you that work in the field, will we'll know to do calculations on encrypted information versus raw data. So significantly slower. But you can get some insights. You can get some basic classifications. You could classify the population into uh, certain groups of people with certain symptoms, for example, of, of diseases. And in fact, that's exactly what our research team did. On the right, with the medical data from the many hospitals, we were able to make histograms uh, showing that, for example, in this case, heart disease is much more prevalent than other diseases, et cetera. But this is very, very low level insight, so a lot of research is still required. But clearly, if there was more silicon, more memory, more processing power, we could crank significantly more uh, computations and get great insights uh, on encrypted data in a fully privacy-preserving way. The, in addition, so you can encrypt everything, let the third-party suppliers, like a Fitbit, uh, or a hospital, no, I would say a Fitbit or any of the other third-party suppliers do the analytics on your encrypted information. Or what you can also do is move the analytics, move the creation of the insights to the edges of the Internet of Everything. And so you can see that in that situation, most of the information, let me go back, most of the information analytics can remain within your home. Uh, you can do the analytics, for example, on, on your mobile devices without having it go to the cloud. And so it's much more private. One example uh, of where that is even more important, above and beyond privacy, is in transportation. For example, there is this uh, corner of a street where there are cars, there is a human, there is some infrastructure like a traffic light, and we want to minimize congestion and improve safety. Uh, as you can see, in effect, Xerox runs some of the red light cameras uh, in some of these intersections. There is uh, cameras, there are also easy pass, RF type transponders, and those could allow you to, to create insights very quickly, locally, at the edge, to then be able to make it more safe and less congested. There is also a great partnership that's emerging in uh, Michigan University, the Mobility Transformation Center, where they're actually building a city uh, that has been built, a test city, a small area, where all this intelligence for transportation and vehicle to everything uh, experiments will be conducted. The key question then is, how do we make sure, for example, a camera can truly see? 
They can take pictures, but they cannot see. And so today, machine learning is being used to allow cameras to do many things. For example, recognize a cat, as you can see here. It looks simply enough, but in reality, it's very complex. Because machine learning algorithms require engineering time and domain expertise to carefully craft them and define the features. And once they are designed, in addition, you have to train the system that is supervised learning with a lot of labeled images such that the machine ultimately know or the camera knows that, yes, indeed, um, these are cats, these are dogs, people, etc. So it's a lot of people expertise, and we do this in our transactional processes for forums today in healthcare. But it is very, very time consuming and expensive. So one of the breakthroughs here is unsupervised deep learning, where in fact there is a network so that more mimics how a brain works, a neural network with many layers, and you give it a lot of pictures or, and it, or videos, and it doesn't need to be labeled. And so then at the end, the nodes within the system will start to recognize things, just like a baby. You can show a baby or a young child many, many cats. It will know it's a cat, uh, that it's kind of the same kind of animal. But of course, at the end, um, you will need to tell uh, the, the child that it's actually a cat. But number one, the reason that this is possible now is because there is much more silicon and computation available uh, today. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, you need to fine-tune fine -tune these algorithms with some learning so that, in fact, in the end, they know that what it sees is, in fact, a cat instead of something else. So, I, again, I like this, this cartoon. So there is this robot looking at a cat. It says, a cat, good boy, and say, hey, what is this? Ah, it's a state-of-the-art robot. And the key thing here is that this robot was trained with 10 million images over three days leveraging 1,000 machines with 16,000 cores. So again, these things are not possible to be put at the edges of the internet. We need significantly uh, input from the silicon circuit community to potentially design chips that are customized to be able to process these kind of deep learning algorithms in a much more effective and efficient way and at low cost. I show two of them here. Uh, on the left is uh, by Professor Z and her team at MIT, uh, and, but there are several in the sessions at this conference today. So being able to create low-cost, deep learning hardware with embedded privacy is a great opportunity uh, for our community. But in addition to being able to see with similar deep neural networks, the systems will also learn how to hear, how to read, how to speak, and ultimately, a system will learn how to build human relationships. For example, here you can see Gball. It's a computer launched by a Professor Brazil from MIT that really integrates himself within the fabric of everyday lives and really helps the families and the people of, around them. And so indeed, technology will disappear into the fabric of everyday life as predicted almost 30 years ago. So with that, I would say our community, there's a lot of amazing challenges for decades to come, most probably, uh, that, you can, uh, that you can all work on and resolve. Uh, before moving on, I want to show, thank two people, or two, uh, number one, I would like to acknowledge the research of all the PIs, the academic PIs that I refer to uh, in my talk today. You guys are doing amazing work, so please uh, do keep it up. And I know Professor Z is in the audience today. Uh, so lots of work happening around the world. This is representing multiple universities and all three pillars I discussed. And then I want to thank my colleagues at Xerox and at Park uh, that help that are really the PIs for the three pillars that I discussed today. And both Janos and Nacho are in the room today. They're with us today in case you want to do a deep dive or have more questions uh, around the smart everyday objects or the information-centric networking. Uh, Dr. Sun is on the East Coast, and she couldn't make it. And of course, finally, thanking all of the Xerox people and all of our collaborators uh, around the globe. Thank you very much.